Hey, what's up you lot, Path here. I've got a pretty short video for you today where we're going back to the early days of quantum mechanics and looking at the first iterations of the modern model of the atom. But before we do, I wanted to thank all of you who voted in the poll on the community tab of my channel. About 50% of you asked for a quantum mechanics video and I'm going to deliver on that. But this isn't that video. I'm actually working on a two-part mini-series on what I think is one of the coolest theorems in quantum mechanics. And we're actually going to be digging into all the mathematics as well. This is something I haven't done in one of my videos for a little while, so definitely keep an eye out for that in the coming weeks. In the meantime though, let's get going with this video. Early in the 20th century, Ernest Rutherford concluded from his gold foil experiment, technically conducted by Geiger and Marsden, that an atom consisted of a small but dense region of positive charge at the center, surrounded by a large region of negatively charged electrons. And this led Rutherford to think up a planetary model for the structure of the atom. In this model, the small but dense region of positive charge, the nucleus, behaves like the sun at the center of our solar system, and the electrons orbit the nucleus, like planets around the sun. This is why it's known as the planetary model. Now, there are definite drawbacks to this model, as we'll see shortly, but I quickly want to talk about why this model may have been so appealing to Rutherford, and to other physicists for that matter. Not only does the planetary model show some sort of similarity, some sort of harmony, between small-scale structures such as atoms and large-scale structures such as solar systems, but it actually goes a lot further than this. The really pretty thing about the planetary model for the structure of the atom is that the force that's meant to keep these electrons orbiting around the nucleus behaves a lot like the gravitational force that keeps planets in orbit around the sun. Not only are we dealing with attractive forces that keep the smaller objects in orbit around the larger objects, but the forces in question can be expressed in very similar ways mathematically. Here's what I mean by this. The classical gravitational force of attraction between two massive bodies, let's say the Sun and the Earth, is given by this expression here, where m1 is the mass of the Sun, m2 is the mass of the Earth, and rg is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. And if we consider a region of positive charge, so that's the nucleus of our planetary atom, we say that it has a charge of positive q1, and we think about one electron with a charge of negative q2, and they're separated by a distance of Re, then the force between the nucleus and the electron is given by this expression. I'm sure you can see the similarities here. The mathematical expression is almost the same, except in the second case you replace the masses of the objects being considered in the gravitational force with the charges in the electric force. A couple of things to note here. First of all, we see that there are negative signs in both expressions. This conventionally is used to mean that they are attractive forces. However, the negative sign in the gravitational equation is actually inbuilt to the equation, whereas the negative sign in this equation comes from the fact that we're dealing with a negatively charged electron. Either way though, the final result in both cases is an attractive force, and in the gravitational case, we see that the force is directly proportional to both the mass of the Sun and the Earth, whereas down here we can see that the force is directly proportional to both the charges of the nucleus and the electron. Lastly, both of these forces are inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two objects being considered. And so it's not just the visual similarity between the large-scale solar system and the small-scale atom that's so appealing, it's actually a mathematical similarity as well. It's essentially like going, take the solar system, shrink it, replace the sun with a nucleus, replace the planets with electrons, consider the electrostatic force rather than the gravitational force, and voila, you have a brilliant model of the atom. However, sadly, the universe is not as simple as this. And as we mentioned earlier, there are problems with the Rutherford planetary model for the structure of the atom. Now, although in reality planets orbit the Sun in elliptical orbits rather than circular orbits, this wasn't really a problem at the time. Some scientists believe that eventually the planetary model of the atom would become more complicated and include elliptical orbits for the electrons surrounding the nucleus. So let's discount that dissimilarity between the planetary model of the structure of the atom and the actual solar system itself. Rutherford himself noticed that there was a problem with this model because classical physics tells us that any accelerating charge is going to radiate energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And the electrons orbiting around our nucleus in this planetary model are indeed accelerating. Here's the thing, we can think of those electrons as moving at a constant speed, initially at least, around our nucleus, but the fact that they're changing direction constantly by moving in a circle is what means that they are accelerating. Because remember, acceleration is changing velocity. And velocity is a vector quantity. Not only does it have magnitude, that's the speed at which an object is moving, but it has direction as well. So these spinning electrons are constantly changing direction, so they're constantly changing velocity, and therefore they're accelerating. Which means that, like I said, they should be emitting electromagnetic radiation, visible light, for example. 
But then this energy they're emitting must come from somewhere. In other words, the electron loses energy as it emits this radiation. This means it should slowly spiral towards the nucleus. Now clearly, this model isn't a good one for describing the structure of atoms. Two reasons, really. Firstly, we would notice if all atoms were constantly chucking out radiation. And secondly, atoms exist. If all electrons constantly spiral towards nuclei, then atoms wouldn't exist. Whereas we know that there are stable configurations of electrons around nuclei of atoms, and these electrons don't constantly fall or spiral towards nuclei. Now this is where a physicist named Niels Bohr came into the picture, and essentially used the physics equivalent of flex tape on the broken planetary model. He realized that in order to improve this model so that it more closely matched the actual behavior of actual atoms in the universe, we would have to place some restrictions on it. The main restriction that he placed on this model was that electrons can only exist specific distances away from the nucleus. In other words, they can exist only at specific energies. Electrons were only allowed to exist in particular places. They couldn't spiral into the nucleus anymore. Why was this the case? Niels Bohr had no idea at the time. It was just, like I said, flex tape. Who knows why it works, but it just does. It seems to explain how atoms actually behave in our universe. Or at least it does slightly better than the planetary model did. Not only was Niels Bohr's atom stable, in that electrons didn't spiral towards the nucleus, but it actually explained another phenomenon that had been observed many, many years before. Scientists have noticed that if you take a sample of a certain element, let's say hydrogen, and then pump it full of energy by like shining some light on it or something, eventually that sample of hydrogen will give off electromagnetic radiation of its own. And it gives off electromagnetic radiation only at very specific frequencies. Even if we were to shine white light, which contains all frequencies of light, or at least all frequencies of visible light, onto a hydrogen sample, the hydrogen sample would later only emit specific frequencies. Later, this frequency emission was attributed to the fact that electrons in higher energy levels fall back down to certain lower energy levels, and the frequencies of light that they emit correspond directly to the difference in energy between the energy level it was in first and the energy level it dropped down to. Now, there already exists lots of brilliant resources explaining this idea in more detail, so I'm not going to talk about it much more in this video. Instead, I'll leave some links in the description below if you're interested in learning a bit more about it. But my point is that Bohr's model even explained this phenomenon. In other words, even though he didn't really know why electrons should only be allowed to exist in certain energy levels around the nucleus, Bohr's model was really effective because it got us closer to what we observed in real life. The model predicted much more closely how atoms actually behaved. And so sometimes flex tape is actually really useful. Nowadays, of course, our quantum mechanical model of the atom looks quite different to the Bohr model. We've come a long way, but the current quantum mechanical model is based on the foundations of the Rutherford and Bohr models of the atom. And by the way, I'm not saying that Bohr wasn't clever or a genius. After all, his model really, really worked at the time. It described much more accurately how atoms behave in real life. Just because he didn't know exactly why at the time doesn't mean it wasn't a useful contribution. It really was a stroke of genius, and like I said, one of the foundations on which modern quantum mechanics is built. So, a couple of things to take away from this video then. Firstly, unfortunately, the universe isn't always as pretty as we'd like it to be. And secondly, sometimes fudging around with a model until it better predicts what we're trying to study is a good idea, even if you can't always explain exactly why. There's time to explain later, maybe five years down the line, 10 years, 300 years down the line, who knows? And of course, it's entirely plausible that your model is completely wrong but it just happened to predict the right things. Either way, I think all of this is really cool. I think it's really interesting how Bohr came up with his model of the atom and how that's been one of the things that's taken us to modern day quantum mechanics. And with all of that being said, I'm going to end the video here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do leave a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's a two-part mini-series on the Ehrenfest theorem coming soon, so keep an eye out for that. I'll be running through all the symbols in this weird-looking equation and talking about what they mean, whilst also talking about ideas that are essential in order to understand quantum mechanics. But here's the kicker. You only need to know high school level maths in order to understand what the Ehrenfest theorem is trying to tell us, at least at a fairly basic level. So, like I said, definitely keep an eye out for that over the next few weeks. Let me know in the comments down below here what other topics you want me to cover, and if I've made a mistake at any point in this video, please do let me know as well so we can correct that as quickly as possible. Lastly, check out my second channel. I released some new music fairly recently, so if you haven't heard that and you're interested, definitely do go check that out, and follow me on Instagram at Pathflux. Once again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you really soon. Thank you.